Hi Church, uh, I really count it a privilege to be with you again and to be preaching in this Christmas season about uh, Mary. I think for many of us, if we've been around church for a while, and that might at least be some of you, uh, we know the Christmas story so well. So some of the wonder of the story uh, is lost on us, and I almost want us to relive the story as though we're experiencing it for the first time. So I want to begin with a question and ask you, you know, what kind of mother would be fit for the Son of God? Now, I know some people have uh, given up their children for adoption and in certain circles they're able to have some kind of say in who they would like that child to go to in terms of what kind of parent. Uh, and there's various profiles and different categories of things. But what, were you, what would you say if you were to choose an ideal mother for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? I mean, would you say that she needs to be educated? Um, what kind of place sh should she live at? Um, should she be well connected? Should she have uh, good financial means to be able to support the child? Uh, perhaps an ideal mother for the Lord Jesus Christ would be somebody in the royal family uh, who's really got uh, all those connections, some measure of power and influence. And so if Jesus was born today and the choice was up to you, I wonder who you would choose to be Christ's mother. Because it's an interesting question as we come to think about uh, God's choice of Mary as the mother of Christ. Because Philippians chapter 2 reminds us that Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. And that's a beautiful hymn in Philippians 2 about Christ emptying himself, uh, taking on human nature, becoming the lowest form of human being, a servant humbling himself. And so Christ's humility should surprise us not only in how far he was willing to come from heaven all the way to earth. Not only should Christ's humility astound us in the circumstances of his birth, which we can remember in a couple of weeks time as we go to that manger scene. But we should be astounded by Christ's humility in who he chose for his mother. And we know her as Mary. And so I want us to read this account of Mary together. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew records uh, the Christmas account, as does Luke. And so I want us to turn to the Luke account in Luke chapter 1 from verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel. Since I am a virgin, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. So today we're continuing on in our Christmas series that we've entitled Emptied. He made himself nothing. And we're going to see something of Christ's humility, evidence of Christ's humility in even choosing Mary to be his mother. Mary herself was empty. She was empty of privilege. And I think what I find astounding as I've come to this passage again is God works in ways that we often don't expect him to work. In fact, in most of history, humility wasn't regarded as a virtue. 
It's something we take for granted now. So when you ask anyone, even the average man on the street, you know, tell me about humility. We kind of know that, hey, somebody who's puffed up and proud and arrogant, uh, you know, is, uh, that's not a quality that we want to admire. You know, humility is, a, is, is, is now a virtue. But that wasn't always the case for most of history. And certainly in certain philosophical circles today, those that are particularly followers of David Hume, the philosopher, he was one that was dead against humility. He saw it as weakness. And in New Testament times, the Greeks and the Romans, they saw humility as weakness. This word humility, hamas, meaning from the soil down to earth, earthy. Uh, actually, people wanted to soar among the stars. They wanted to be great. And it was only after Christ came that he infused the very word humility with a dignity and with a beauty and with a, a wonder and an awe that we can admire. He turned our human values on their head. And it's because of Christ that humility now is a distinctly Christian virtue. So I want us to look at three ways that Mary was empty. The first one is Mary was empty of position. Position. And that's Luke chapter 1, 26, the passage we read, where we read that God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. Now, we as modern readers read this. We know the end of the story. We've heard about Nazareth. We've heard about Galilee. So it doesn't shock us. But if you were an early reader of this account, as Luke wrote this and penned this as an apologetic, he wrote it to Theophilus. We read at the beginning of his gospel, he wanted to convince Theophilus of these truths. Theophilus and no doubt others would have been shocked when they read this. Because the angel Gabriel flew right past Judea, which had been the center of God's work for centuries, and flew to Galilee. And not only did God overlook Judea for Galilee, he in fact overlooked Jerusalem for Nazareth. And when you think of all the symbolism with Jerusalem, in fact, God ignored the most holy place, the very temple in Jerusalem, and he entered the lowly home of a teenage girl called Mary in Nazareth. Nazareth is not mentioned in the Old Testament. I don't think the, this little village had even been built then. It's not mentioned by the ancient historian Josephus, that Jewish historian who lived uh, around that time. Uh, Nazareth is not mentioned in any ancient Jewish writings. And Luke seems to even be concerned to tell us, his readers, where Na Nazareth is. He says, Nazareth, a town in Galilee, because he assumes that we probably won't even know where it is on the map because it, it doesn't feature. It was nothing in terms of cities of the day. It was a small peasant village. You could call it a hamlet. It was there in the mountains uh, with a population of about 150 to maybe 400 people max. So just think about living in a place like that where maybe there's only 400 people. Probably a lot of them are relatives, people you know. Everybody knows everybody's business. And it's a completely insignificant place, such a small place. And you might be interested to know, how do we even estimate how big these places were from archaeology? Well, they look at the graves, and graves were often on the outskirts of uh, the city, and so based on the graves on either side of where Nazareth was, we were able to determine how many people lived there. Now, Nazareth was not on any major route. It was kind of out of the way, off the beaten track. If you wanted to go to Nazareth, you really had to make a special effort to go there. It wasn't kind of like you could just pass through it on the way to somewhere else. And so I want you to see that Mary was empty of position, even the place in which she lived. But she was also empty of possessions. This was a, a peasant village. And she was a peasant girl in a peasant village. Farming community. She had nothing to offer God. This is incredible. Nothing to offer God except herself. Except herself. And we know from Luke chapter 2 and verse 22 that when Mary and Joseph presented baby Jesus at the temple, they were only able to sacrifice and offer a pair of doves which according to the Old Testament meant that they were poor. They weren't able to offer any other kind of sacrifice. We also know from history that Joseph probably had to walk about an hour journey every single day to a very nearby city called Sepphoris. And Sepphoris was a bustling city about six kilometers north of Nazareth. And they were building theaters there and other uh, great works. And he probably worked as a construction worker. Uh, the Greek word for what he did for a living is tekton, and it's probably a mistranslation to say that he was a carpenter. 
And that gives us some insight that Christ probably went with his father every day to work, walking an hour to Sepphoris, walking an hour back, and they were probably stone masons. Maybe that's why Christ spoke about building your life on the rock, and we have these images of cornerstones and, and buildings and constructions. So I want you to understand it was a tough life in Nazareth. Money was short. If you wanted to earn a living, you had to go outside of the city, outside of this village. And yet God chooses Mary, empty of privilege, empty of position, empty even of possessions, empty in terms of the place in which she lived. Not much to give, but those are not the things that primarily concern God. And so I want you just to listen to the surprise from some who come later when they heard the news that Jesus the Messiah was from Nazareth in Galilee. And these are just a selection of scriptures. John 7, 41, we read, Still others asked, How can the Messiah come from Galilee? In John chapter 19 and verse 19, you will remember that Pontius Pilate even wrote on the sign above Christ's head as he was hanging on the cross. What did he write on that sign? He wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. This unknown place even featured in terms of world history because there it was labeled and emblazoned upon the top of the cross. I think just demonstrating a kind of shock and maybe even almost ridicule that Jesus could be the king of the Jews when he came from such a place. Then in John chapter 7 and verse 50, Nicodemus, this Pharisee who had been seeking Christ, was looking for truth. Christ had challenged him to be born again. He was wrestling with the truths of the gospel and who Christ is. We read in John 7.50 that Nicodemus had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number. And here he is talking to the Pharisees. He asked, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's been doing? So Nicodemus is saying to his colleagues, how dare you just condemn this man? You haven't even listened to him. You haven't even got to know him. You're just prejudiced against him. And it's probably because of where he comes from. And look what they reply. They say to him, are you from Galilee too? Look into it and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. And they just had this view that, that a prophet couldn't come from such a humble place. And then finally, do you remember Nathaniel's question as we just look at this selection of scriptures? Nathaniel, also a seeker, in John chapter 1 and verse 45, we read that Philip found Nathaniel and told him, We found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And what does Nathaniel say? Nazareth! Exclamation mark. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Can anything good come out of Nazareth is what he says in some other translations. And what does Philip say to him? Come and see. Come and see. I love that invitation. God invites us this Christmas to come and see. To bring our doubts, to bring our questions, to bring our fears, our uncertainties. Even to bring our high and mighty, snobby, pompous, preconceived, pretentious notions of who the Messiah could or couldn't be. All those notions of greatness. And to just come and see. To investigate. To be surprised at how God works. To be surprised at where God works. And to be surprised at who God works through. To accomplish His kingdom purposes. And it's radically different from who you and I would choose to be Christ's mother. Or who you and I would perceive as great. Nathaniel put human limits on the power of God. And I think you and I often do the same. Maybe you look at your home life and you say, what good can come from there? Maybe you look at your marriage and your family and you say, what good can come from there? Maybe you look at your financial situation where you find yourself here now, almost in the middle of December. And you say, can anything good come out of this? Out of the season of COVID? Maybe you look at your lack of experience or lack of talent and you say, Lord, can you really use me? Can anything good come out of there? But the invitation stands. Come and see. I don't want you to see all the stuff that I've accomplished. I want you to come and see Christ in my life. Let's see Jesus. Let's allow Christ to be magnified this Christmas. Let's allow him to be birthed in our Nazareth. And whatever that place is in your life that you think is, is, is too lowly for God to enter in, why don't you invite people to come and see what God can do in your life? See what he reveals. Because do you know that if God wants to work through you, there's no distance or disadvantage of place 
that will prejudice him towards you. You may think that your background, your disadvantaged past, your ordinary roots disqualify you to be used by God. Well, then let Nazareth in Galilee shine its angelic light on your faulty thinking. Come and see. Here is God meeting with Mary. And not anywhere, God is meeting with Mary in Nazareth, in Galilee of all places. So no wonder when the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. No wonder Mary was greatly troubled at his words. The Greek word means she was agonizing, wrestling, dialoguing in her mind. She was troubled and she wondered what kind of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Mary could only be surprised. That was, there was the surprise. How can this be that God is willing to use me? And so can I ask you today, are you still surprised that God is willing to use you? To work through you? Because I want to challenge you to continue to be surprised. Don't ever let grace grow old. Continue to be confused. Continue to be in wonder. Continue to be in awe that God by His grace would use you and use me. Because your wonder and your surprise is evidence that humility and grace is at work in your life. And invite people to come and see God's story in your life. So that's the first thing Mary was empty of. She was empty of position. But number two, Mary was empty of experience. She was empty of experience. In the passage we read in Luke chapter 1 from verse 31 says, You will conceive and give birth to a son and you to call him Jesus. And then jumping to verse 34, look what Mary asked the angel. She says, How will this be? Since I am a virgin. And then the angel answers, The Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. I want you just to put yourself in young Mary's shoes. Just think how this news must have hit her. She's a virgin. She's had no experience carrying a child. She's got no experience being a mother. It's not as though this is child number six and she says, hey, I've got this waxed and we all know what it's like. By the time you get to, you know, a couple of children down the line, you don't even worry about them anymore because you realize you're stressed over the first one for nothing. But Mary doesn't have that experience. And do you know how old she was? There's a number of of apocryphal manuscripts and so on. And one of those old manuscripts says that she was 14 years old. And there's another ancient manuscript that states that she was only 12 years old. So we don't know exactly, but many of the scholars I read choose to go with the younger date for various reasons. That this was a 12-year-old girl. A 12-year-old has chosen to give birth to the Son of God. Just imagine that. Maybe some of you are watching and you've got a a daughter who's in grade 7. A grade 7 who who maybe has barely hit puberty is going to be the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is who God chooses. And yes, it's strange in our culture because in those days people got married a lot younger. But still there's something incredibly humbling at who God would choose. And we must never underestimate our young people and what God can do through them. But naturally, being a young girl... In verse 34, she's curious as to how this is all going to happen. And this is what the Greek text literally says. She asks, how will this be since I have never known a man? And the word know obviously means sexually. I've never known a man. How how is this going to work? She knows enough about uh, how these things work to know that she's still a virgin, that she hasn't been with a man. And, And I just love her beautiful, raw honesty. But I sense that there's also some fear. And I think you and I often experience a crisis of fear as well when God asks us to do something in terms of our obedience. And we're wrestling and we realize, sure, this is a step of faith. God is asking me to do something that's countercultural, that's, that's really out of my comfort zone. But the angel is so gracious in explaining just in a very simple way to this 12-year-old girl and just assuring her, do not be afraid, Mary. The Lord is with you. And when I think about Mary and I think about her lack of experience, I'm moved by her faith because I realize that she trusted God, recognizing that she had to trust him moment by moment. God didn't give her a roadmap and say, hey, Mary, this is what's going to happen. And she didn't have a gynecologist. You know, this is what happens in the first trimester. And there wasn't, you know, pregnancy for dummies and these books that we have available to us. She just had to step out in faith 
and trust God day by day, moment by moment, at each turn. And yes, she was trembling with fear, but she continued to trust God and His Word. And so for each one of us watching, do there still come moments in your life when you tremble with fear? I think with all our helps, all our tech, all our Googling and, and whatever, sometimes I think when God asks us to do something, we just say, hey, yeah, God, I've got this. I've got my degrees. I've got my experience. I've got all of this. Lord, I've got this. And I think Mary is a lesson to us that we sometimes should tremble with fear and recognize that actually there's, we are stepping out in faith. We cannot do this apart from Christ. Do you still tremble with fear when you feel out of your depth? When last have you even been stretched in your faith to do something, to speak to somebody, to share the gospel, to, to just do something that's out of the routine? Because that's what happened in Nazareth. This was out of the routine. Or have you become so self-confident? Mary was poor. She was probably illiterate. Her experience was limited. She had never mothered before. Her knowledge of the scriptures was only what she had memorized and how amazing her faith was. When you read her song called the Magnificat a little bit later in Luke chapter 1, you can see her just oozing the scriptures. So even with her illiteracy, she had memorized God's word and she was trusting God and obedient to God's revealed will. A Bible commentator by the name of Kent Hughes writes, From all indicators, Mary's life would not be extraordinary. She would marry humbly, give birth to numerous children, never travel further than a few miles from home, and one day die like thousands of others before her, a nobody in a nothing town in the middle of nowhere. As we probe this beautiful text of the Annunciation, we cannot miss an inescapable fact. The greatest news ever proclaimed in Israel came to the humblest of its people. The humblest of its people. What a beautiful thing to reflect on. And, and even later as we read about the shepherds, also these humble people, they heard the good news first. And in Mary's song of worship that I just spoke about, the Magnificat, she's moved to wonder and praise a little bit later as she sings these words. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. The Lord comes to those who acknowledge their need, who acknowledge their insufficiency. Christmas isn't for those who are self-righteous, self-sufficient, who've got it all together. Christmas is for those who recognize that they need to be saved by a Savior. So Mary was empty of position. She was empty of experience. And thirdly and finally, Mary was empty of the ability to control her future. There was no way she could control her future. It was out of her control. And look at Luke chapter 1 and verse 27. We're told that the angel came to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. So the plot thickens. You can see if you used to watch soap operas back in the 80s and 90s, you would realize, hang on a minute, what's going to happen to her future? Mary and Joseph are betrothed to be married. If you know anything about the culture of the day, betrothal was very, very serious. It was the start of a marriage. And uh, for a betrothed bride, you would have to live at home for about a year with your family. And then after a year, there would be a massive ceremony and then you would consummate the marriage. So to call off an engagement was essentially uh, a divorce because this was the beginning and the start of an actual marriage. So Joseph was well within his rights when he hears, hey, hang on a minute. You know, my bride-to-be is pregnant. He's going to come to only one conclusion. She must have been unfaithful to me. And I'm in a small town like that. Who was it? What would be running through his mind? And he could, with proof, have demanded the full extent of the Old Testament law to be meted out on her. Thankfully, in these times, they, they were no longer uh, stoning for adultery. But he could have demanded that, the death penalty. And as Mary reflected on their relationship, she must have wondered... Is this going to withstand this kind of news? Is Joseph going to believe me? Is he going to divorce me? Am I going to have to raise this son of God alone? What of Joseph's own desire for children? What if he's, he's upset that the firstborn is not his? Just think of the possible scandal in a small village like that. Everybody knows everyone's business. The gossiping glares. 
Who's going to believe her? Here she is, unmarried, pregnant young girl, betrothed to a man in this process of marriage, and he's apparently not the father of the child. So either he is and he's lying, or there's somebody else in the scenario. So just think about how she had to empty herself of the ability to control her future. She had to leave all of this in the Lord's hands. And this was her response. Here's her response. She could only leave the outcome of her future in God's hands. Sometimes that's all you can do. I want you just to look at this humble faith of this young teenage girl and, and her response in verse 38. She says, I am the Lord's servant. And the Lord's servant, Mary answered, may your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. I just think that is so beautiful, her response, even as she recognizes what's outside of her control. She can't control her reputation in the future. She's got no PR manager. She's got no social media specialist. Her future is entirely in God's hands. And she says, yes. She steps out in faith and she says, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be to me exactly as you've said. She's saying yes, yes to potential disgrace, potential abandonment, potential divorce. But she fears God more than she fears people. She says yes to an uncertain future that's not yet written. And she even makes her own personal dreams, her own personal goals. As a young girl, she must have had dreams and goals and things of what she wanted to do or how she pictured things were going to be. And all of that had to become secondary. And she simply leaves the entire future to God and humbly says, Lord, may it be so, as you have said. And I believe when she said, I'm the Lord's servant, she was saying, as young as I am, God is Lord of my life. And I think you and I can often be very flippant in how we just say, yeah, you know, Jesus is my Lord. How flippantly we call God Lord. So here's two challenging questions to reflect on. If you are watching this and you claim that Jesus is Lord. If you're watching and you claim and you say, hey, this is, this is what I claim. This is my profession. God is Lord of my life. Well, here's two really, really challenging questions that I've heard. Number one, are you willing to obey anything the Bible clearly says to do, whether you like it or not? That question is a tough one. Number two, are you willing to trust God in anything he sends into your life, whether you understand it or not? So are you willing to obey anything in the Bible, whether you like it or not? And are you willing to trust God in anything He sends into your life, whether you understand it or not? That's a picture we're seeing here. And not of somebody who's got it all together. This is from a 12 to 14 year old girl. I love what Tim Keller writes. He says, anybody who wants to become a Christian must basically do the same thing as Mary. Becoming a Christian is not like signing up for a gym. It's not a living well program that will help you flourish and realize your potential. Christianity is not another vendor supplying spiritual services you engage, as long as it meets your needs at a reasonable cost. Keller says, Christian faith is not a negotiation. It is a surrender. Surrender. And Mary is a beautiful picture to us of what surrendering to God looks like. But as we tie things together and bring them to a close, I want to say that there's one other aspect as we look into the future from this point. I want you to fast forward the clock 30 years because Mary was not only empty of the ability to control her own future, she was empty of the ability to control the future of her son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's 30 years later and Mary is standing at the foot of the cross as Jesus, his son, hangs crucified, bleeding, his skin ripped and torn, as he empties his life. I want you to encourage uh, to look to Jesus, to behold Jesus, even at this Christmas time, to not divorce his birth from his death. I want you to look at that cross. I want you to see him emptied of position. I want you to see Christ emptied of his possessions. I want you to see him emptied of prestige, emptied of honor, Hanging there, bleeding, emptied of power. I want you to see him empty of glory. But then I want you to see something that can only be seen with the eye of faith as we stand at the foot of the cross. And that is that history's greatest act 
the greatest act of empty vanity. As we look at the cross and it seems like a wasted life, an empty life, a futile life. As we look at that, we recognize that it's actually history's greatest victory. And Mary's life is just a dim mirror of Christ's life. I believe that a life emptied in service of God only seems empty to the world, but it is filled with unfathomable fullness. You know, Jesus said, if you lose your life, you will find it. But those who want to keep their life and fill their life with everything other than God, those are the ones that lose their life. They're not truly living. It only seems that way. He who fills his life with anything other than God empties it of meaning, but he who empties his life for Christ's sake in humility will find life. And you and I watching this today, hearing these words, have a far better view than Mary ever did when she said, I'm the Lord's servant. We know how the story ends. Even as she stood at the cross, she didn't know about the resurrection until afterwards, but you and I do. And yet she was able to, before that, by faith, say, I'm the Lord's servant. And we know that this emptiness was just a prelude to fullness. We know that Christ's death was just a prelude to life. And we have seen that indeed a good, good, good thing has come out of Nazareth. Jesus' death has led to life and it's led to life and purpose for us. So can anything good come out of Nazareth? Yes, come and see. Come and watch and be amazed and be wowed again this Christmas. And let Jesus Christ be born afresh in your heart, in your life. As you respond humbly and say, here I am, Lord. I'm your servant. Do with me as you wish for your glory. And my life will be filled. It will be filled to the brim with your will and your ways. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, I just ask that you would help us this Christmas to just recognize again your beauty and your majesty. Lord, we thank you for Mary. Lord, we know that she wasn't perfect. We know that she had challenges like the rest of us. But we thank you, Lord, that she had a childlike faith. And perhaps even as you said, unless we become like little children, we cannot enter the kingdom of of God. And we thank you for her amazing faith. Lord, a faith that sometimes as we go into adulthood vanishes amidst the complexities of life instead of just trusting you with a simple, bold faith. Lord, I pray that we would... Look to you this Christmas for what we need for life and for godliness. That, Lord, you would work this humility in us. That we would recognize, Lord, that we are not the great people that we think we are. In fact, Lord, we are beggars apart from you. We are sinners in need of grace. Sinners in need of a Savior. Lord, just drive us in fresh dependence upon Christ. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for this great good that has come out of Nazareth, out of the most unlikely place. And, Lord, may there be great harvest and fruit that comes out of the unlikely place of our homes and our lives. Even our church, Lord, even our church, little old Rosebank Union Church on this small corner in one small dot in the universe. May you bring good and godly fruit that would bring you glory and renown for your name. Because we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.